The Lord be with you. Good afternoon and welcome to this ordination to the Office of Minister of Word and Sacrament Service in the Classes of Zealand of the Reformed Church in America. It is good to have you gathered here in this place with us as we gather to worship God, to hear from God's Word, to celebrate communion, and of course, the reason why most of us are here, to celebrate Rachel Klontmacher's ordination. Uh, the order will follow in the bulletin, which if you do not have, um, Dave Bosher is in the back and he would be happy to get you one if you make eye contact with him. We'll start with our intro it as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship. The words are found in your bulletin. Please join me in our responsive call to worship. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. The light no darkness can overcome. Christ is the living word. Through the word we are redeemed.
Christ is the living water. At the font, we are raised with Christ to new life. And Christ is the great table host. At the table, saints and sinners gather to receive and proclaim redemption. Our gathering hymn is number 521, which can be found in the red hymnals either in front of you or underneath you. Please rise and body your spirit as we sing together. of God, grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. And together God's people say, Amen. Amen. As we just sang together, we are prone to wander. And yet because of who God is, abounding in steadfast love and mercy, we can come to God honestly about who we are and the ways that we have failed to live into who God calls us to be. And so let us together confess our sin. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. It is in Jesus Christ that our sins are forgiven. And as forgiven people, we are called to live in a new, in a different way, to love God wholly and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Friends, believe in this good news and live in its peace. May the peace of Christ be with you. Would you share a sign of that peace with one another that feels appropriate to those around you? (laughs)
Gracious God, open our hearts, open our minds, open our lives to the word that you would have us hear today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our Old Testament lesson is from Isaiah 43, verses 1 through 13. Hear the word of the Lord. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Bring forth the people who are blind yet have eyes, who are deaf yet have ears. Let all the nations gather together and let the peoples assemble. Who among them declared this and foretold to us the former things? Let them bring their witnesses to justify them and let them hear and say, it's true. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I've chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. I declared and saved and proclaimed when there was no strange God among you, and you are my witnesses, says the Lord. I am God, and also henceforth I am he. There is no one who can deliver from my hand. I work, and who can hinder it? And the Gospel lesson from John chapter 12, beginning with verse 20. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. Those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. This is the word of the Lord. Characters. You meet a lot of them in ministry. Chances are, after a few years, you'll become something of a character yourself. <laughs> but if you're clever, you'll realize that you can learn a lot from these so-called characters, whether you meet them in life or in literature. One of the courses that Rachel took with me at Western Theological Seminary uh, was called Christianity and Literature. And for the final exam, I asked students to talk about three characters that they had met in the novels we had read together. 
Rachel, I'd like to begin today by reminding you of which characters you chose and what you said you learned from them. Aunt Ifoma from the novel Purple Hibiscus by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. From Aunt Ifoma, you said you were reminded to ask for delightful and life-giving things, including peace and laughter. You also admired the way she swept her whole family into morning prayers in the living room, a string of short prayers punctuated by song. I'm not surprised you liked that. And then there was Dinah Morris from George Eliot's novel, Adam Bede. You wrote, in Dinah Morris, I found an unexpected role model, both in her public and private prayer life. In both places, she exhibited a steadiness of purpose and connection to God. And then you quoted this passage as an example. Dinah closed her eyes that she might feel more intensely the presence of a love and sympathy, deeper and more tender than was breathed from the earth and sky. That was often Dinah's mode of praying in solitude, simply to close her eyes and to feel herself enclosed by the divine presence. And then gradually, her fears her yearning anxieties for others melted away like ice crystals in a warm ocean. Ah, I like that one too. And then Godric from the novel of the same name by Frederick Buechner. You wrote, even as others come to him hoping for some kind of miracle of healing or provision, Godric prays earnestly and aware of his own needs. Dear Father, see how these thy children hunger here. They starve for want of what they cannot name. Their poor souls are famished. Their foolish hands reach out. Oh, grant them richer fare than one old sack of bones whose wits begin to turn. Feed them with something more than Godric here, for Godric's no less starved for thee than they. I wanted to start the sermon by reminding you of these three characters, Rachel, and what you learned from them. Those learnings are part of the many credentials that you bring to ministry. But Let's move on now to see what we can learn from some of the characters we met in, well, first the gospel passage. Everyone was running after Jesus, usually for the wrong reasons. He had just raised Lazarus from the dead, and that had created quite a stir. We can hardly blame people for picking up palm branches and shouting, Hosanna, save us as he rode into Jerusalem. Maybe what they meant was, save us too. That is, save us like you saved Lazarus. Who wouldn't want to follow somebody who could resurrect people from the dead? Well, the Pharisees knew they couldn't compete, so they just shrugged and said to one another, you see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Representing the world are the Greeks who approach Philip saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip doesn't know what to make of them, so he goes and tells Andrew, and then together they go and tell Jesus. Rachel, if you forget everything else I say, there's a pretty good ordination sermon in those few verses. When people come to you, what they're really asking is to see Jesus. So make sure they see Jesus. Grab a friend if you need to, but make sure they get to see Jesus. But I'm curious about why those Greeks wanted to see Jesus. Aren't you? They must have had reasons. 
expectations? Maybe it was part of that Lazarus effect. What did they want from him? Whatever they expected, it could not have been what they got. In fact, it's not even clear that they were within earshot when Jesus starts in about how a grain of wheat needs to fall into the ground and die before it can bear much fruit. Now, think about that. I sort of imagine Philip and Andrew looking at each other at that point and whispering, who said anything about wheat? We said Greeks, not wheat. <laughs> it, it really is sort of one of those blessed are the cheesemakers moments, but <laughs> be that as it may. It's typical, I think, of us to misunderstand and typical of Jesus to give us what we don't expect. Think about it. Everybody's running after him, expecting him to be a certain kind of Messiah. But he isn't having it. He has his own agenda, his own calling. And if we're called to follow him, then we'd better adjust our expectations too. All right, so we've gleaned at least two important learnings from the characters in this passage. First, make sure people see Jesus. Second, adjust your expectations to God's expectations. Now, let's look to Isaiah to see what we can learn from him. If ever there was a passage that begged to be read at an ordination, it's Isaiah 43. Don't fear, for I've redeemed you. I've called you by name, you're mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. That's the kind of thing that every pastor ought to have needle-pointed and hung on their study wall. And if you're still casting about for ideas about what to give Rachel for her ordination, start needle pointing. She won't mind if it takes you a few years. <laughs> but who am I kidding? This isn't a passage just for pastors. Every believer ought to have that passage on their wall. Every congregation ought to have it on their wall. For that matter, the whole church ought to have it on their wall, on their wall and in their hearts. If you know anything about the original context of the prophet's promise, you'll know that the people of God had no reason to expect God's grace. They'd done nothing to deserve it, but that's just it. It's not about deserving. This isn't about people's credentials. Maybe you noticed that. After those soaring promises, God gives the reasons that God is going to do all these wonderful things. And why is God going to do these things? Because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. That's it. I love you. You're precious. It's not about the people's credentials. It's about God's credentials. God the creator, God the redeemer. And this God, contrary to all expectations, has decided to love us, to save us, to redeem us. There's a word from the Lord in there for all of us today. I'm sure of it. But Rachel, there's surely a word from the Lord in there for you as you begin your ministry. I happen to know that your credentials are impeccable. You are a highly capable person, a good preacher, a gifted leader, a wise and compassionate counselor. You have a heart for justice, a gift for friendship. And don't even get me started on your musical gifts. I'm sure there's something in the Bible that says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's sight-reading skills. 
but I confess to you all now, I'm guilty. <laughs> I do covet them, but be that as it may, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. God has given you a whole constellation of gifts, and I'm excited for the ways you will use them for God's glory in the days and the years ahead. But at the end of the day, it's not about your credentials. It's about God's credentials. And on difficult days, when you're going to want to, on difficult days, you're going to want to remember that. Maybe even needle point it. Or maybe you should just needle point that quote from Godric. Feed them with something more than Godric here, for Godric's no less starved were thee than they. In her book, Opening Israel's Scriptures, Ellen Davis talks about how one of the most prominent themes in this part of Isaiah is the nature of vocation, and not just individual vocation, but also the corporate vocation of a people, a vocation to serve God. And she refers to passages like the one we read as psalm-like poems, Psalm-like poems that are both an excellent preparation for pastoral ministry and a powerful antidote to burnout. And as an example, she quotes Isaiah 49, 4. And as for me, I said, I have exhausted myself to no end, for nothing and in vain I have spent my strength. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord. My recompense is with my God. And then Davis writes, those lines capture much of what ministry feels like after the initial flush of excitement has passed. Those who would stay in that work must orient themselves to God's glory, which may have little to do with perceptible success. Rachel, I want you to be in this for the long haul. And I know that you are surrounded today by people, by characters, who love you and who want that for you as well. So this is the word from the Lord that I hope you will hear and remember from all of the characters we encountered uh, in this sermon today. Rest in the confidence that comes from the fact that it's not about your credentials. It's about God's credentials. Rest in that and remember that you are precious in God's eyes and honored and loved. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. My name is Reverend Kayla Fick. I serve as the classes leader for Classes Zealand, and it is my great joy to preside over the ordination section this afternoon. So the words from the Liturgy of the Reformed Church in America. Beloved in the Lord, we have come to ordain a minister of word and sacrament in Christ's holy church. Christ alone is the source of all Christian ministry throughout the ages, calling women and men to serve. Following his resurrection and ascension, Christ gave gifts to the church. These gifts were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. We stand in a tradition where God calls and empowers deacons, elders, and ministers of word and sacrament to enable the mission of the church. Therefore, let us welcome Rachel Klopmacher, who comes to be ordained to the Ministry of Word and Sacrament. On behalf of the Candidate Care Committee of Class of Zealand of the Reformed Church in America, we have presented Rachel for ordination. The committee has examined her and found her to be a person of sound learning and Christian character. 
they affirm that she is ready to be ordained to the office of Minister of Word and Sacrament. Rachel, ministers are called to build up Christ Church. They are to proclaim God's word, to declare forgiveness through Jesus Christ, to call publicly on the name of the Lord on behalf of the whole congregation, to celebrate Christ's holy sacraments, baptizing, presiding at the Lord's Supper. They are to be pastors and teachers, sharing people's joys and sorrows, encouraging the faithful, recalling those who fall away, helping the sick and the dying. Rachel, before Almighty God, in the presence of this congregation, the classes asks you to sincerely answer these questions. Do you confess together with us and the church throughout all ages your faith in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Yes, truly, with all my heart. Let us all stand with Rachel, confessing our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into death. On the third day, be seated. Do you believe in your heart that you are called by Christ Church and therefore by God to this ministry of word and sacrament? Yes, truly, with all my heart. Do you believe the books of the Old and New Testaments to be the word of God and the perfect doctrine of salvation, rejecting all contrary beliefs? Yes, truly with all my heart. Will you proclaim the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, upholding the witness of Holy Scripture against all schism and heresy? I will, and I ask God to help me. Will you be diligent in your study of Holy Scripture and your use of the means of grace? Will you pray for God's people and lead them by your own example in faithful service and holy living? I will, and I ask God to help me. Will you accept the church's order and governance, submitting to ecclesiastical discipline should you become delinquent in either life or doctrine? I will, and I ask God to help me. Will you be loyal to the witness and work of the Reformed Church in America, using all your abilities to further its Christian mission here and throughout the world? I will, and I ask God to help me. Will you strive to fulfill faithfully, diligently, and cheerfully all the duties of a minister of Christ, to preach the word of God in sincerity, to administer the sacraments in purity, to maintain proper discipline in the household of God, and to shepherd the flock faithfully. I will, and I ask God to help me. I invite Rachel to kneel and all those who have been ordained as ministers and elders in any Christian tradition to come forward. We recognize Rachel has come from and shaped by many places. So she's headed to the Presbyterian Church in the U.S. and the RCA has shaped her and formed her. So all of you all come forward and have a lay on of Rachel. <laughs> Let us pray. God of grace, pour out your Holy Spirit, gentle as dove, burning as fire, upon Rachel. Fill her with grace and power for this ministry of word and sacrament. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Rachel would stand, and you all can stay right here. <laughs> Don't move. <laughs> 
in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the only head of the church, I now declare that Rachel is ordained as a minister of word and sacrament. Everyone else can have a, or actually, no, everybody's going to stay standing. This is the piece I forget, but everybody stays standing here. Rachel will now read the Declaration for Ministers of Word and Sacrament. Rachel will be the 448th pastor in Classes Zealand since it began to read this declaration and become a minister. I, Rachel Noel Klotmacher, in becoming a minister of the Word of God in the Reformed Church in America within the classes of Zealand, sincerely and gladly declare before God and with you that I believe the gospel of grace of God in Jesus Christ as revealed in the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments and as expressed in the standards of the Reformed Church in America. I accept the Scriptures as the only rule of faith and life. I accept the standards as historic and faithful witnesses to the word of God. I promise to walk in the spirit of Christ, in love and fellowship within the church, seeking the things that make for unity, purity, and peace. I will submit myself to the counsel and admonition of the classes, always ready with gentleness and reverence, to give an account of my understanding of the Christian faith. I will conduct the work of the church in an orderly way <laughs> and in accordance with the liturgy and the book of church order. Trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for strength, I pledge my life to preach and teach the good news of salvation in Christ to build up and equip the church for mission in the world, to free the enslaved, to relieve the oppressed, to comfort the afflicted, and to walk humbly with God. I ask God and you, his servants, to help me so to live until that glorious day when with joy and gratitude we stand before our great God and King. <laughs> June 5th. <Yes. laughs> In the name of the Lord, receive the welcome of Classes Zealand and the Greater Church. We all pledge our support, affection, and prayers while you live and work among us as a servant and a minister of God's Word. And a hand of fellowship to Rachel. The congregation may be seated. Yep. <laughs>
you've received already a lot of instructions. <laughs> <laughs> but here's a little more. Beloved servant in Christ, be attentive to yourself and to all the flock given to your care by the Holy Spirit. Love Christ, feed his lambs, tend his sheep. Be an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Attend to reading, prayer, study, preaching, and teaching. Do not neglect the gift that is in you. Put these things into practice. Devote yourself to them so that all may see your progress. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Continue in these things, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Rachel, guard what has been entrusted to you. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will win the crown of glory that never fades away. In thinking about the inward journey, I hear in this official charge a call to self-responsibility. <laughs> I thought that was something you could really grasp onto. <laughs> First, I hear responsibility in regard to the gift that is in you as Paul says it to Timothy. Paul knows that there are many deterrents, that there are many detractors, that there are many reasons for us to shrink back. But this is an invitation to live thoughtfully into your many and varied gifts. It's an invitation to let go of the fears and the self-doubts and the discouraging messages. It's an invitation, Rachel, to express your gifts with joy and laughter and humility and creativity. I also hear the responsibility to pay attention to yourself. Again, the words of Paul to Timothy. Paul knows that when we don't attend to ourselves and what is happening inside us, that we'll be controlled by the shadows that we refuse to recognize. So, this is an invitation to continue the very painful but very fruitful work that you have already been doing so faithfully. It's an invitation to look squarely at your motivations, at your strategies, at your needs. And it's an invitation to respond instead of reacting and to give and receive love instead of languishing. Third, I hear a responsibility to guard what has been entrusted to you. Also, Paul to Timothy, you have been entrusted with an awareness of and a love for a God of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. This is an invitation to not only give, but also to receive compassion and kindness and patience from God. It's an invitation to offer compassion and patience to yourself the way that you do to other people. And it's an invitation to be your truest God-designed self, which is a beautiful woman of God. The Lord be with you, dear sister, as you express your gifts, attend to yourself, and cling to the love of God. May your heart remain open. May you be awake to the nature of your true being. May you be healed, and may you be a source of healing to all humanity and all creation. May you be at peace. And thinking, about the outward journey and what people see in the ministry that you do, I want to encourage you to dress the part. So here's what I mean. My charge comes with a gift.
It's a stool. You'll remember from our liturgical shenanigans class that ritual objects like this are highly stylized. Uh, they once had a practical purpose. The stole originated as the towel that Jesus wore around his waist when he washed the disciples' feet. Stoles today are primarily symbolic. They signify the service that you commit to, the feeding and tending of the flock given to you by Christ. And alas, in that flock, not just folks you like, but your whole flock. <laughs> so you will wear it, or that one, or another metaphorical one, when you move from the piano to that place behind the table. And when you invite your flock to that table where Christ feeds them. And when you invite your flock to rest beside the still waters of their baptism. And when you speak to them the good news of the gospel and when you bless them in God's name, even the ones who disrespect you and question your call. I've seen that. And I know that that's one of the ways that you set forth an example in speech and conduct and love and faith. And this particular stole has an additional symbolic layer because it's a handmade stole in Pentecost colors because your heart is ablaze with the Holy Spirit. And second, this stole belonged to my mother. And she was an amazing preacher. One of a host of amazing women preachers that I have been blessed to hear and to learn from in my life. And you are among them. I mean, you're one of them. And you're among them. <laughs> so it's fitting for you to wear this. You wear it well when you attend to reading and study and prayer, which fuel all your ministry. And you will wear it, and it will fall close to your heart and let it remind you that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. The last piece before we gather at the table is to commission Rachel into ministry. Rachel will remain a member of Zealand Classes even as she moves geographically from us, but we at Classes Zealand have approved the ministry of Rachel to Second Presbyterian Church to serve as a Lake Fellow in parish ministry. Rachel, by standing here, you accept this call, and I'd also like to invite Elizabeth forward. Elizabeth is a representative of Second Presbyterian Church. She's going to answer a few questions on behalf of Second Pres for us today to ensure their care for Rachel and as we commission Rachel into this ministry. Elizabeth, on behalf of Second Presbyterian Church, do you receive in the name of the Lord this servant, Rachel? Do you promise to honor her authority, to welcome her pastoral care as a representative of Jesus Christ? We do. Do you promise to encourage and pray for her as you labor together for the welfare of the world? We do. <laughs> do you promise her such financial and personal support that she may serve among you with joy and not with grief? 
We do. By the name and by the authority of the classes of Zealand, I now declare that the Reverend Rachel Klotmacher is duly commissioned as a specialized minister serving at Second Presbyterian Church. Thanks be to God. Thank you. My call to ministry happened in this space. I was here to play for the installation of my friends Miriam and Eric. And independent of something that Miriam was scheming, I was moved to ask the question. You were scheming, it's true. Um, was being behind the piano the only piece of furniture in a sanctuary that I wanted to be behind? And so it is an honor and a fulfillment of that call to stand behind this table today. But it's not my table, so we'll get to that in a minute. <sighs> this meal that we are about to receive is a feast, an abundant feast of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. Remembrance, communion, and hope are the foundation of the story of God in the world into which we are deeply rooted. Remembrance connects us to the past, all the way to the beginning when God created the world out of an overflow of love, when all of creation, stars, trees, rivers, animals, and humans lived in right relationship with God and with one another. These relationships were shattered, but God made reconciliation and wholeness possible by becoming human in Jesus Christ. So here especially we remember his life, his radical and countercultural teaching, his faithful ministry to those on the margins, his miracles of healing and restoration. We remember his death, his resurrection, his ascension to the right hand of God, where together with the Spirit, Christ is in constant intercession for us. But a good story doesn't stay in the past, so we come to this table to commune with Christ in the present. We who are gathered here in community with one another are also somehow drawn up into the very presence of Christ here and now. This communion with Christ and with one another spans all time and all place. Finally, we come to this table in hope, looking for hope. Thanks be to God that this story isn't finished. The same God who created the world whole and out of love gives us a taste of the future when everything will be as intended. Trees will flourish and tree as they were created. Rivers will be free to river as they were meant to river. Each of us will throw off whatever it is that entangles. Tears, pain, death will be no more and we will glorify God and enjoy God forever. Maranatha, come quickly. Lord Jesus. As I said, though I have longed to stand behind this table, it is not my table. It is not Second Church's table. It does not belong exclusively to the Reformed Church in America. It is Christ's table, and it is open wide. So today, come, whether today you feel full of faith or you feel very little, whether you were here this morning or it has been a very long time. Because we come here not because we ought, but because we may. Not because we are righteous, but because we are penitent. Not because we're strong, but because we are weak. 
not because we are whole, but because we are broken. So come. There is room enough here for everyone. The Lord be with you. And lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy and right it is, and our joyful duty to give thanks to you at all times and in all places, O Lord, our Creator, almighty and everlasting God. You created heaven with all its hosts and the earth with all its plenty. You have given us life and being and preserve us by your providence but you have shown us the fullness of your love in sending into the world your Son, Jesus Christ, the eternal word, made flesh for us and for our salvation. For the precious gift of this mighty Savior who has reconciled us to you, we praise and bless you, O God, with your whole church on earth and with all the company of heaven, we worship and adore your glorious name. I invite you to sing after me. Holy, holy, holy Lord. Most righteous God, we remember in this supper the perfect sacrifice offered once on the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ for the sin of the whole world. In the joy of his resurrection and in expectation of his coming again, we offer ourselves to you as holy and living sacrifices. Together we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray, that the bread which we break and the cup which we bless may be to us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Grant that being joined together in him, we may attain to the unity of the faith and grow up in all things into Christ our Lord. And as this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf, and these grapes from many hills into one cup. Grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus, on the same night that he was betrayed, took bread, although his had gluten in it, and this does not. <laughs> he blessed it and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Every time you do this, remember me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he poured it out, saying to them, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Every time you do it, Drink it in remembrance of me. The bread which we break and the cup which we bless are to us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. We will receive communion this afternoon by coming down the center aisle. You will be handed a piece of dairy and gluten-free bread. You'll be invited to go to either side to take a cup out of the tray 
then return to your seat by the outer aisle and partake in your seat. If you would like to receive in your seat, an elder is available to serve you. And if you would simply like to come forward for a blessing, you are also invited to do that as well. Come, for all things are now ready. Come.
Our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession today will follow a rhythm of praying for this world and community and giving thanks for the life and gifts of our dear friend, the Reverend Rachel Klompmacher, and then pray for the work God has prepared for Rachel going forward. We invite you to join us in this litany when we say, we pray to the Lord, you may respond, Lord, hear our prayer. And when we say we give thanks to the Lord, we invite you to respond, thanks be to God. So, Lord, hear our prayer. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. And we give thanks to the Lord. Thanks, thanks be to God. God, we pray for peace. Peace around the world, peace in our nation, peace in our own hearts. For an end to war, for an end to senseless gun violence, we pray that the systems that stand against true peace may be made right. For racism to end and for the flourishing of our planet as Rachel says, that the rivers may river. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Oh God, we rejoice in the many ways Rachel is an agent of God's peace in this world for the gifts of peace that she gives to others. We give thanks to the Lord. Thanks, thanks be to God. We pray peace over Rachel now, in this very moment. And we pray peace over the people at Second Presbyterian, that Rachel may give peace in all that she does in her time there, and that God's peace may rule and reign through her. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. prayer. And we pray for love. We pray because God is love. We pray for love that all people, people from all places, all races and ethnicities, of all abilities and levels of income, of all genders and orientation, that all people would experience your love, O oh God. And in that love, that we, your people, would welcome and include and celebrate all that you have created. We pray that we may live into the commandment to love, to love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, to love you with the entirety of our being and all that we have. Oh God, where there seems to be no love in the world, send your spirit in love. Where we lack love, would you inspire us in compassion? Teach us to love, for you, are, O oh God, are embodied always and forever love. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. God, we give thanks for the love you have shown us in Rachel. We give thanks for the love that she shares with her family, with her friends, for this congregation at Second. God, thank you for the ways that you have worked your love in Rachel's life from the very beginning and the love that you have shown her in your faithfulness here on this day of her ordination. We give thanks to the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. And God, we pray for Rachel that you may surround her in love as she is sent off to Indianapolis. God, we pray that love may surround her there, that your abundant presence of love will be known to her in the people of Second Presbyterian and in the community that she will live in. God, we pray that she may love you and love all people as you have taught her. We pray to the Lord. 
Lord, Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for community. O oh God, who came to earth to be in community with us, remind us that we are beloved and that we bear your image and that those we love bear your image and those that we don't love bear your image. Holy Spirit, we pray that all will know that they are welcome in you. We pray that you draw together your church in unity, Lord, and that we may find peace and wholeness in unity in the body of Christ. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Community, we can rejoice in the many ways we have all been blessed by connection with Rachel and the seemingly effortless gift she has of drawing people together. What a blessing that is. And so for that, we give thanks to the Lord. Thanks, thanks be, be to God. God. Rachel, as you move forward into the next step of your journey, we pray that you will be, con you will be blessed by community at second. And we play, pray that you will continue to bless others as you has have, as you have blessed so many of us, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for wholeness and flourishing. God, we pray for the wholeness and flourishing for all of those who struggle with mental health and physical health. We pray that their minds and bodies and souls would be made well so that they would flourish because they are made in your image and created by a good and loving God. We pray for the wholeness and flourishing of creation, that as the earth groans and the rocks cry out, that we would live in ways that contribute to the flourishing of all creation and embody holistic love for all of what God has created. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And God, we give thanks for Rachel, for the fullness, the wholeness that you have created in her, the ways in which she flourishes because you first loved her. God, we give thanks for the ways that she speaks wholeness and flourishing to us, to the people that she surrounds herself with, the ways in, we, in which she lives wholeness and flourishing to celebrate the earth that you have created. We give thanks to the Lord. Thanks, thanks be to God. God. And God, we pray for wholeness and flourishing for Rachel. You are a faithful God and therefore you have prepared a place for her in which she may thrive and flourish in her ministry and life. And God, you have created her to be a beautiful and creative and honest and compassionate person. And in this wholeness, would you bless her ministry and life to flourish as she goes forward, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayers. prayers. And now, as our Lord Jesus has taught us to pray, we pray as a community, our Father our in heaven, heaven, hallowed be your name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Just a couple of things before we sing our closing song and depart. 
It is warm in here. Maybe it's just me, but I invite you to gather, maybe grab some food. There's a reception that's been prepared for us, and find a place outside, perhaps, um, to get some fresh air. I'm going to collect myself just for a minute after we depart, and then I will be available. Um, I don't think I'll stand and greet at the door. We will never get out of here. Um, but I will come be a home in a minute. And finally, a word about this closing song. Um, yes, it is about music, and it is about God being our rock, but I love the, the reality that it invites us to, that our world is not okay, um, and, and yet it is. And so I invite you to sing with whole heart the tension that is in this song, and if you are able to stand on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Let's sing together. Please rise and bow. people who I love and who love me. May God bless, keep, and protect you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. 
May God's countenance turn toward you and wrap you in his peace. And will everyone who longs for this to be true say amen. 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 Go in peace.